This is 1988 Tops, where every card has a story to tell. Your hosts are David McKellis and Matt Kuzma. Let's play ball. Welcome back to 1988 Tops. David, what's our card for this week? Our cards this week are Kevin McReynolds. Two cards, the Mets team leaders card with Kevin McReynolds and Gary Carter. And the Kevin McReynolds base card of 735. All right, another two card episode. Feels so productive when we are able to knock two cards out of the enormous queue of cards that are before us. David, we'll get to Kevin McReynolds in just a moment, but first it looks like we have some follow up from last week's episode about Ernie Riles. Almost as soon as we posted the episode, Jeff Snyder sent a message on Twitter and said, I'm dying to know what you decided on the Ernie versus Ernie conundrum. (laughs) I have extra information to send you if you need it. And Matt, if you'll recall, Ernie on his baseball card was spelled with an A. And then later, baseball cards were spelled without an A. And now he goes by Ernest Sans A, E-R-N-E-S-T. I told Jeff, uh, we didn't really figure it out. You know, as much research as we do here, we did not figure out the Ernie etymology. But Jeff had some articles from the time that will help us figure out this conundrum. One is from July 3rd, 1985, in the Wisconsin State Journal. I imagine that Jeff had this just, you know, the the paper copy of this in his office. (laughs) Or or the microfiche. (laughs) Right. And this... 1985 issue of the Wisconsin State Journal was entitled On the Importance of Being Earnest. And apparently, Riles had always gone by Ernie without an A, but the Brewers had old contracts that showed he signed his name Ernest with an A. And so in response to that, Ernie said he had no idea how that happened. I I don't know if maybe he was just signing his name wrong to try to get out of the contract later on and Ah. say, well, that's not my name. That's some other Ernest Riles. So apparently he had contracts signed with both spellings. But after that 1985 article, it says he will be Ernie with no A from now on. But that was prior to this Topps card. So apparently the Topps Corporation did not get the hint. There's another article in 1989 from the Santa Rosa Press Democrat where the author is talking about how all of these fun facts are not very fun. And so he gets into his own fun facts and says, Ernest Riles prefers to be called Ernest, not Ernie. And his name is not spelled with an A, despite what you might read on a baseball card. And he also says, Riles is an avid bowler who throws a straight ball and averages about 160. Now that's a fun fact. So basically, the problem here is that it seems... Ernie was unclear on the spelling of his name on some of his contracts as well. I do love the idea of him him intentionally signing his name different ways so that you say, as long as the checks cash, we'll say, oh yeah, that's definitely, I signed it correctly, everything's fine. But if for some reason there's a problem with the contract and you need to get out of it later, you'd say, oh, that wasn't me, that was some other guy. Clearly, Ernest was not really consistent and maybe the banks were also not consistently checking and as long as it looked good enough it worked out for for Ernest. thank you jeff snyder for that follow-up and i think that we've gotten to the bottom of the ernie versus ernie versus Ernest versus Ernest situation yeah we got to the bottom of it if there are any other obscure small town papers that we need to check in the basement of a state university library for i know that jeff snyder is on that case and we will hear about it soon so thank you jeff for listening And thank you for you all. If you have corrections, you have comments on previous episodes, if you have follow-up, you can email us at 1988topspodcast at gmail.com. Now let's go to Kevin McReynolds. And David, why did we choose Kevin today? Matt, as we've been going back through the archives and figuring out what cards we need to cover, what teams we haven't covered in a while, I realized that we had a team that we've only talked about twice And we haven't talked about this team in a very long time. I put the call out on Facebook and said, any guesses who we're going to talk about this week? I said, we have a team we haven't discussed in a while and a two-card player. And almost immediately, listener Joe C. said, it looks like you haven't covered any Mets since 2020, Tim Tuffle, September 2020. He even cited 
the date. So my guess is Kevin McReynolds, since he appears on the Mets team leaders card, and he got it in one. One of the first guesses, good job, Joe C. Thank you for listening, and thank you for the um, detailed answer as well, especially you know using your methodology, showing us your work. But yeah, we're, we're talking about Kevin McReynolds. We have a couple other Mets that are coming up in the queue, including a request, but thought we would knock out a two-card episode, especially one of a player with a Sabre bio. And this Sabre bio is written by Thomas J. Brown Jr., who also wrote the Neil Allen, Sean Dunstan, and Benito Santiago bios. Two cards is always a good episode, catching up, filling in some gaps in Mets history. I remember Kevin McReynolds for his 1989 Topps card. He had a record breaker card, and it was kind of an odd record breaker card. And when I looked at it, it, it was like, all right, cool. <laughs> and we'll get to that when we get to his 1988 season. But he was a, a much better player than I think people give credit for and, and maybe a better player than I remember him him being. Let's go to the front of 735 where we see Kevin in the batter's box, a right-handed hitter. He is staring down the pitcher intently. Very straight-up stance. He's got a nice mustache. He's got a kind of ugly-looking Mets batting helmet. And I got to say, these pinstripes of the Mets uniforms, they're not the best look to me. I think they're a little too busy. Like, the maybe the pinstripe is too thick. And with the side piping and the Mets script and number on the front, there's a lot going on in the front of this jersey. And also, his pants are very short. He's got real stirrups, but it isn't really a flattering look. He almost, yeah, it just, it doesn't look great on Kevin looks very wrinkled this is a very very wrinkly looking jersey and and maybe others are it's not as noticeable but with the pinstripes and the all the wrinkles and creases going perpendicular to the pinstripes you have what looks like some kind of optical illusion like I might be hypnotized by looking at this card and especially In contrast to the Mets team leaders card that we're going to get to a little bit later, which has an item of Mets clothing on it that I would wear, this white home uniform, I agree with you, it's it's not the best look for Kevin here. In the background, you got some blurry fans. You've got one person who's in the dugout hiding between Kevin's legs. Right in the five hole. (laughs) You've got some kind of assistant coach there with his arms crossed. You can also make out the, are those the phones to the bullpen on the wall? It looks like there's three or four phones, maybe. You can use those phones to call Charlie Kerfeld to tell him to stop eating ribs in the outfield. (laughs) One goes to the press box, one goes to the bullpen, and one goes to Jamaica Joe's Wings in Flushing, Queens. (laughs) So maybe not the best look about the, the front of this card. Well, Give it a solid 6 out of 10. Now going to the back of 735, we have Kevin McReynolds, outfielder. six foot one and 210, right-handed batter and thrower. Drafted in the first round by the Padres in 1981. Born October 15th, 1959 in Little Rock, Arkansas, with his home in Little Rock, Arkansas. Kevin, whose first name is actually Walter. His name is Walter Kevin McReynolds, but he went by Kevin I I also saw W. Kevin McReynolds on some property transactions that he was listed on. And he was, as you said, born in Little Rock, Arkansas, grew up on Camp Robinson, an Arkansas National Guard base. His parents, Raymond and Catherine, had four kids, three boys and a girl. They grew up in modest circumstances in a small house on the National Guard base. Kevin's dad, when he was younger, was a talented baseball player before he entered military service. Kevin also showed promise as a youngster. He was a really good football and baseball player going into high school. He went to Sylvan Hills High School in Sherwood, Arkansas. And when I looked into this school, I found that the school district that Sylvan Hills High School is in has been subject to 30 plus years of desegregation lawsuits stemming from the aftermath of the federally ordered desegregation of Little Rock High School in the 1950s. The year after the Little Rock Nine desegregated Little Rock High School, Governor Orville Faubus shut down the schools in Little Rock for the entire 1958-1959 school year. That was the year Kevin was born. That's called the lost year of Little Rock High School. At the time, there were three school districts in the county. 
Little Rock School District, Pulaski County Special School District, and the North Little Rock School District. While the population of Little Rock was 65% white, the population in Little Rock School District flipped to 70% black because all of the white population pushed their kids either to private schools or into these other county high schools. White families sent their children to the Pulaski County and North Little Rock schools, and those districts facilitated segregation and provided unequal facilities to black students well into the 70s and 80s. The Little Rock School District then filed a lawsuit against these other school districts that were within the county and the state, seeking a consolidation of the county's schools. And in 1984, the court issued a decision on liability, finding that the two districts had, in fact, committed unconstitutional and racially discriminatory acts that resulted in the segregation of Little Rock School Districts. Over the next 30 plus years, multiple desegregation plans were agreed to. The state agreed to pay a, a couple hundred million dollars in upgrades and busing to assist the programs. And yet, Pulaski County School District was not declared in compliance with the desegregation plan as of January 2022. So they still, even with some of these upgrades, have not met the desegregation plan. I raise this mostly because we like to get into the history and get into some of the the closeness of some of these issues to the time that we're talking about and to the present day. I'm not trying to draw any implications around Kevin or his family, but rather just to describe the situation that this was a segregated school system. And this is almost up to the date news that there's still part of this desegregation plan that is being overseen by the federal courts. Sylvan Hills has a good sports history, and Kevin is part of that. As of 2022, the school has won 24 state championships across nine sports teams, primarily in baseball and girls track and field. Famous alumni include 2016 Olympic long jump gold medalist Jeff Henderson and plastic bag filming creep from American Beauty, Wes Bentley. When Kevin started at Sylvan Hills, he told the coaches that he wanted to play both baseball and football, and they told him he could do either, but not both. And he said, fine, I won't do either. (laughs) And the coach smartly allowed him to play both, as he was talented at both sports. Uh, In 1978, he was Arkansas High School Player of the Year, hitting 634, and was the MVP of the state tournament that Sylvan Hills won. And he also had a 16-1 record as a pitcher in high school. After that season, he was picked in the 19th round by the Brewers, but Kevin's family didn't really have any money, and the Brewers didn't offer him a signing bonus, so he decided to go to college at the University of Arkansas. Go Hogs! We will get to a few Arkansas players in the 88 set. Les Lancaster, Tom Pagnazzi, and Johnny Ray, who was a teammate of Kevin's in 1979. As a freshman, Kevin made a splash. He played in the College World Series with Arkansas and this was the first time that they had ever made the College World Series, the team ended up with Arkansas's best ever finish, finishing in second place, losing in the championship game to Cal State Fullerton. And that Cal State Fullerton team had Tim Wallach as their third baseman. But McReynolds was named to the World Series all-tournament team after hitting 566 with two home runs and five RBIs. And that really put Kevin on the map and in the sights of scouts. He continued to improve. He was All-American his sophomore and junior year and finished his college career with a 337 average, 33 home runs, 121 RBIs, and a 642 slugging percentage. So scouts know him from high school and that freshman College World Series performance. He ends up earning a much higher spot in the draft, the first round, <laughs> and signs a $115,000 signing bonus. And normally... When we're looking at baseball reference, we see rookie league the same year of the draft and a college player going straight from college into the minor leagues. Unfortunately, during that junior season, Kevin injured a ligament in his leg during a collision at home plate, and he ended up having to sit out the remainder of the 1981 season. That takes us to 1982, in which he destroyed single A and double A ball. In 90 games at single A Reno, he hit 376 with 28 homers and 98 RBIs, earns a promotion to Amarillo, hits 352 in 40 games there. And then in 1983, he continues on that tear, moving up to AAA Las Vegas. He's playing really well and earns a call-up 
to the Padres in June 1983, and that leads to the first of two fun facts on the card, and that is that he belted his first Major League home run June 2nd, 1983. This was, in fact, his first game. He went one for four against the Phillies with that first home run of his career. Over that month of June, he hit only 178 with two home runs and was sent back down to AAA, where he continued to destroy minor league pitching, hitting 377 on the season with 32 home runs at AAA, which earned him a spot back in Major League Baseball for September. He hit better over that last month, bringing his season average up to 221. 1984 was a big year for the Padres, and that was Kevin's first full season in the big leagues. San Diego had an outfield of Tony Gwynn, Mick Reynolds, and Carmelo Martinez, and all of them were 24 or younger. Martinez and McReynolds were called the M&M boys, again, highlighting the creativity of baseball sports writers and fans in the 1980s. This was somewhat in reference to Maris and Mantle, but also just because they have M's as names in the same way that any team that has more than two players whose last name begins with B is going to start being called the Killer Bees, inevitably. Multiple senior smokes. <laughs> Everybody is named Chico, etc. These M&Ms didn't quite live up to those expectation of Maris and Mantle, but they both had pretty good seasons. The team also had veterans like Steve Garvey, Greg Nettles, and Terry Kennedy. Meanwhile, Kevin was focused on just proving himself after 1983 ended with him just bouncing up and down from the big leagues. He wanted to cement himself as this solid everyday starter in the outfield, and he did that. He played 147 games that year in center field, hit 278 with 20 home runs and 75 RBIs. Fantastic season, 20 home runs. That leads to the second fun fact on the card that he delivered his first major league pinch hit home run August 8th, 1984. Kind of strange if he played 147 games in center field, how much pinch hitting is he doing? Yeah, he only pinch hit five times that season, and this was his only pinch hit in 1984. Still an odd fun fact. Yeah, what did they... How about fun fact? He had 20 home runs in his rookie season. Or fun fact, I'm sure he was like MVP of AAA when he hit 377 destroying <laughs> minor league pitching. We'll, we'll never yeah. win against these 1988 yes. fun facts. <laughs> it's, a battle, it's a battle that we will be fighting for years, David. <laughs> yes. We'll see if we ever come up with an interesting one. Wasn't there one that was like somebody enjoyed playing guitar? I think that was Matt yeah. Noakes enjoyed playing guitar. What does Kevin McReynolds do? We'll get to those fun facts in a little bit. That season, I called it a rookie season, but I guess technically it wasn't because he had 10 too many at bats in 1983 to be considered a rookie in 1984. Otherwise, this 1984 line would have been a rookie of the year contender. He played great in center field, and he was valued at 19 runs just from fielding alone. He finished first in the National League in putouts, in range, and fielding percentage among center fielders. He finished third in the National League with 2.3 defensive wins above replacement. Overall, he was 10th in total wins above replacement among position players with 5.4, which is really great for his first full season. That's all-star caliber. He even got some consideration for National League MVP, which is, I think, pretty stunning when Tony Gwynn is on your team and and you get votes. Yeah, but he did finish 17th. So I think he may have gotten one or two votes. The Padres finished that season with 92 games won and win the NL West in 1984. The prior two seasons, they had finished exactly 500. So this is a big jump. Only the second time they had ever finished with a winning record, and this time winning the division and going to the playoffs. And they played the Cubs in the NLCS. Kevin played well in the first four games hitting 300 with a home run and four RBIs. And then in game four, he was trying to break up a double play and he broke his wrist. So his season was over. He ends up sitting out the rest of the NLCS. The Padres go on to win that NLCS and play the Tigers in the World Series. And Kevin couldn't play. And he said, I don't want to put myself through the strain of imagining how I'd play a ball in center or what I'd do at the plate. All I can do is cheer. And unfortunately, there wasn't much to cheer about as the Tigers beat the Padres in five games. Moving into 1985, the Padres really couldn't replicate that 1984 success, 
Kevin's average drops to 234. He hit only 15 home runs. Disappointing year at the plate altogether, but still solid defensively in center field. He again led the National League in putouts and recorded a 1.2 defensive war. And that was actually the last positive defensive war of Kevin's career. He was moved from center field to left field and was unable to really replicate that kind of defensive production. That 1985 year was so disappointing that even after having made the playoffs the year before, they fired the manager, Dick Williams. And in 1986, it was a fresh start for the Padres. And Kevin took that opportunity. He turned his offense around and had a great year at the plate. And this is really a quintessential Kevin McReynolds year at the plate. When you look at the back of this card, you see a a 288 average, 26 home runs, 96 RBIs. He also showed a good eye, 66 walks. So he had an OPS plus of 138. He was really consistent with those numbers. Somewhere between 270 and 290, between 25 and 30 home runs, around 90 RBIs. Really consistent for for a few seasons. However, he had oddly a bad reputation on defense. And he said, I've had a bad rap on defense since I've been here. I'm not nearly as bad a defensive player as I've been made out to be in the past. I misjudged a few balls last year. I won't deny that. But I know that most of the chastising was done by the manager, in reference to Dick Williams. I'm not as bad as I was made out to be. Which is really interesting because if you look at the modern metrics, he was one of the best outfielders in baseball in 1984-85. In fact, in terms of defensive war in 84 and 85, he was the second best defensive outfielder after Kirby Puckett. But perhaps because of that reputation, the Padres moved Kevin around in the outfield. He split time in center with Marvell Wynn, played some left field, and the tinkering didn't really help the Padres, who finished 74 and 88 despite Kevin's good offensive numbers. That leads to... Kind of surprising this way to the clubhouse, the Padres end up trading Kevin McReynolds after this season to the Mets with Gene Walter and Adam Ging for Stan Jefferson, Kevin Mitchell, Kevin Armstrong, Sean Abner, and Kevin Brown, December 11th, 1986. The Mets are coming off their big win in 1986 in the World Series. They won 108 games. They added Kevin McReynolds to the lineup too. In 1986, The Mets left field position was split between Mookie Wilson, George Foster, Danny Heap, Kevin Mitchell, all played time in left field. Mookie Wilson was a valuable player, but the Mets were looking for an everyday starter and an everyday almost all-star. And so they went out and tried to get Kevin McReynolds to be their everyday left fielder and number six hitter. They also ended up getting Gene Walter, a relief pitcher, and Adam Ging, who never made it to the majors. They gave up some really highly regarded young players. Kevin Mitchell, who finished third in Rookie of the Year voting in 1986. Sean Abner, who was the overall number one pick in the draft. Stan Jefferson, also a number one pick. And then a couple of low minor league pitchers. Not the Kevin Brown, who would be a six-time All-Star. Lots of Kevins in this trade. We need to do a Kevin analysis. In the overall trade analysis, this trade is listed on Mets sites as an honorable mention of worst December Mets trades, mostly because Kevin Mitchell would win the National League MVP in 1989. That wasn't necessarily a statement on the quality of Kevin McReynolds, who ended up continuing to have good performances for the Mets. So in 1987, manager Davey Johnson of the Mets looks at his lineup, sees that there's only one Kevin in it, but... Still thinks it's a good lineup. He says, I would hope that our third, fourth, fifth, and sixth hitters are now the best in baseball. And there you've got Keith Hernandez, Gary Carter, Daryl Strawberry, and Kevin McReynolds. And then in the seventh spot, Howard Johnson, who would have a 30-30 season. That's an incredibly powerful lineup. And McReynolds had a great year. He hit 276, 29 home runs with 95 RBIs. And he was a quiet player on this team of big characters. Any team with Dwight Gooden and Lenny Dykstra and Daryl Strawberry, you're going to have some excitement. And Kevin was kind of quiet, and I think that Mets fans didn't really know what to do with him. One of those big-time characters is on the second card that we're going to talk about. Yes, and that second card is card number 579, the Mets Team Leaders card. Pulling that up on the Jumbotron right now. And you have here Gary Carter on the left, And Kevin McReynolds on the right, sans mustache. Don't say I love this look 
on Kevin's face. He looks a little skeptical of what's going on. Gary Carter with a very nice smile. But David, you have your eye on this Mets jacket. It's beautiful. It's like a satin jacket with a the Mets logo is like embroidered on there. It's got a patch on the on the sleeve. It's a really nice jacket. Really nice button up warm up jacket. I like it. One thing I do like about the Mets logo is that they made the Y letter turning into an M. I just always thought it was a very creative letter mark that they've got going on there. And the fact that the Mets took the colors from the two teams that left New York. They took the blue from the Dodgers and the orange from the Giants. It, it was a really a cool design that uh, I'm glad has stuck around since the inception of the Mets. Also, Kevin looking looking very young on this card. Looks like he could be Gary Carter's son. This is pretty classic and fitting for these two guys. One of these guys is a media darling who never shied away from the camera. The other guy quietly did his job. Both of them were were big trade gets for the Mets. As we recall from the Floyd Yeomans episode, the Mets traded away four players for for Gary Carter, and then they traded five players, including two first-round draft picks, to get... Kevin McReynolds. So basically, they kind of mortgaged their future on these two guys. So it's interesting that they would be on the card. Also interesting because neither of them shows up on the back of the card <laughs> as a batting leader. Yep. Once again, we, we get the strange decision by the Tops Corporation to put the team leaders on the front of the card who are not actually the team leaders listed on the back. Instead, you have Leaders in batting like Daryl Strawberry with 108 runs, leading in home runs, RBIs, and stolen bases as well. Mookie Wilson with seven triples. And that pitching rotation and bullpen. During that time, Jesse Orozco pitching 58 games. Got Ron Darling with 167 strikeouts. Roger McDowell with 25 saves. Offensively, this 87 team was a really good club. They, they scored the most runs in the National League, 5.1 runs per game. On the pitching side, Dwight Gooden does show up here, but not nearly as dominant as we might expect. Part of that was that Gooden didn't make his first start until June 1st due to a stint in rehab. And so he was still leading the team in wins, as well as seven complete games, three shutouts, leads the team in ERA. An outstanding season for Doc, considering that he only made 25 starts that year due to missed time. The Mets would finish three games behind the Cardinals and miss out on a repeat trip to the playoffs, but they still won 92 games. Kevin was also involved in an odd incident in 1987 that involved a pigeon. Number is 718937 Your memories of some of the wackier plays in the history of the New York Mets. Joe in Brooklyn, you're on Mets Extra. All right. Oh, uh, yeah, the one I remember uh, in April 87. When yeah, that's the one. <laughs> hit the fly ball and uh, hit the bird, and would have been a routine fly out, and again, it being an extra base hit. And he hit a bird! Yeah, there's a guy just carrying a poor dead pigeon off the field. Kevin had the the sad duty of having to find the ball that had struck this bird and throw to second base to try to catch Deion James taking second base. That ball might have been gross. I wouldn't have touched that. That's a health hazard. That is a health hazard. So the Mets do not make the playoffs that year. In 1988, they do, though. This was McReynolds' best season at the plate. He hits 288. 27 homers, 99 RBIs for another great Mets team. This one wins 100 games, wins the NL East, earns a spot in the postseason. Same core of the lineup that had been intact for a couple years, although just another year older. The Mets won the NL East, earned themselves a spot in the playoffs, and also Kevin earned himself a 1989 Topps card that stood out in my memory. It was a record breakers card. And Matt, we've talked about two record breakers in this set thus far in the 88 set we've talked about the benito santiago card as well as the the phil and joe necro card this was kevin mcreynolds a very generic looking kevin mcreynolds running to first base it almost looks like generic baseball player one and then on the back 1988 record breaker big mac is perfect on the base paths kevin steals 21 without being caught St. Louis, Missouri, October 2nd, 1988. 
Mets Kevin McReynolds has set a major league record of 21 stolen bases with no caught stealing in 1988. The former mark of 16 steals in as many tries was established by A's Jimmy Sexton during the 1982 campaign. Like, it's kind of impressive, but it's also like scraping the bottom of the barrel as far as steals records go. That same season, Vince Coleman started a 50 straight stolen base run without getting caught, but it wasn't a whole season without getting caught. So... <laughs> You know, it's not like he was like Kevin was a prolific base stealer. He just it looks like he got pretty lucky and was sent at the right times this year. But 21 steals without getting caught is maybe more impressive because McReynolds never stole more than 14 before that. He wasn't really a speedster. The record has since been broken. Chase Utley now holds the record with 23 steals in a season without getting caught. But it earned him a, a second card in the 1989 top set. So an unimpressive record, unimpressive mustache and card altogether, but an impressive season for the Mets as they make the playoffs again in 1988. That playoff series is in the National League is against the Dodgers. Game one versus the Dodgers, Oral Hershiser. To the mound, he goes all the way to the ninth inning, up 2 nothing at home. Greg Jeffries singles to start the inning. With one out, Daryl Strawberry doubles Jeffries home. Oral Hershiser at that point gets pulled for Jay Howell. McReynolds comes up and takes a walk, and he now represents the winning run at, at first base. Howard Johnson strikes out, and then the next batter is Gary Carter, who hits a soft line drive to center. John Shelby just misses catching this ball. Strawberry scores. McReynolds, as we've discussed, very speedy Kevin McReynolds is chugging around third. <laughs> we talked about Mike Sosha's ability to block the plate, whether legally or illegally, using his large body to block the plate. He's really good at it and kind of served as a brick wall at home plate. McReynolds ran right through him. And Sosha never got the ball, but was blocking the baseline anyways. Nowadays, that would not be allowed. And McReynolds scores the go-ahead run. The Mets win 3-2. to two. He said, I was pretty much zeroed in on him. I didn't make the choice. He made the choice for me by where he was standing. And we will include a video of this uh, really great Kevin McReynolds moment. And I think that there was a little bit of an impression that McReynolds was a loafer and, and didn't try very hard. And this, this one play <laughs> kind of defeats that premise. But... McReynolds had a pretty good series. He hit a home run in Game 4 in an extra inning loss, and then another homer in Game 6 in a victory. But before Game 7, McReynolds was asked about how he felt going into the game, and he said he would win with either outcome. A win, and the Mets would play in the World Series. A loss would get him back to Arkansas sooner so he could fish and hunt. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's not going to go over well. He went 0 for 4 in Game 7. The Mets lost. The Dodgers go to the World Series. Fans didn't love to hear that. He, he was saying, I think, from his personal standpoint, <laughs> he always wanted to win, but if he loses, this is what he's going to be doing in the offseason. I can read it generously, but for fans, it, it doesn't go over great. The Dodgers go on, and we've we've talked recently about their 1988 World Series against the A's. The Mets, however, go home with McReynolds going back to hunt and fish. He received some MVP consideration for that 1988 season. He finished third behind Kirk Gibson and Daryl Strawberry in the National League voting, and then earned a significant pay raise for 1989. A three-year, $5.5 million contract, which at the time was the biggest contract that the Mets had signed. Gary Carter was making more at the time, but his contract was signed when he was an expo. So this was the biggest offer that the Mets had made to a player. The contract included a provision of three $100,000 payments to be used to pay back a construction loan for a duck hunting club that McReynolds will operate. The club was called The Double Deuce. <laughs> McReynolds' uniform number was 22. The Double Deuce occupied 565 acres southeast of Little Rock, Arkansas. And so he had a good place to go hunt and fish in the off season, uh, much to the chagrin of Mets fans. And ducks. 
So 1989, having this new tranquil home for hunting and fishing, he responds with another normal, consistent season for him. 272 at the plate, 22 or double deuce home runs, and 85 RBIs. And at this point, a couple of those core members from the Mets team have started to fade. So Gary Carter and Keith Hernandez aren't regular players anymore. And the Mets record fades a bit too. So they won 87 games and finished second in the National League East, six games behind the Cubs. Meanwhile, Kevin Mitchell hit 47 homers for the National League champ San Francisco Giants, raising, of course, that specter of which Kevin would reign supreme in the trade. I mean, two of five Kevins turned out pretty good. (laughs) 1990, this Kevin McReynolds had 24 homers and 82 RBIs and a 269 average, another solid season. The Mets are again finishing second, four games behind the Pirates. Kevin was good for a 3.6 war, solid production, not, not MVP caliber, but near the top of the league. And in December 1990, he signs a new three-year extension with the Mets. The New York Times said, McReynolds not too flashy, but his $10 million pact is. On the other hand, at this time, Daryl Strawberry had signed as a free agent with the Dodgers. And the, the Mets appreciated McReynolds' consistency, but hoped that he would pick up some of that lost production. The Mets also signed Vince Coleman as a free agent. So now they had two left fielders. They've got to figure out who's going to play center, who's going to play left. And they didn't really solve either of those issues. Coleman played 70 games in center field. The other center fielder was Daryl Boston, not quite Daryl Strawberry. And neither was McReynolds. He didn't live up to the 30-30 Daryl Strawberry numbers. He had a rough season. Fans started booing. The team finished under 500 and, and really... The only power that this team had left was Kevin McReynolds and Howard Johnson. Johnson led the National League with 38 home runs, but after five straight 20-plus seasons, Kevin only hit 16, and his average dropped to 259. Yeah, so this is a down year, and really the, the first down year that he had had in a long time. And so the Mets make him part of another big trade. The Mets acquire two times Cy Young winner, Brett Saberhagen and Bill Pakoda from the Royals for McReynolds, Greg Jeffries, and Keith Miller. This was another one that had sports writers scratching their heads. Jonathan Rand of the Kansas City Star said, I've spent several hours trying to figure out how the Brett Saberhagen trade makes reasonably good sense for the Kansas City Royals. I finally gave up. This is the kind of deal you hear fans suggest on call-in shows. They suggest taking three guys who've become expendable and putting them in a sack to obtain a premier player. You chuckle because the suggestion assumes the other team's front office just fell off a potato truck. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, here's some guys who are fading or who aren't really performing, and then you trade away your two-time Cy Young winner. Yeah, and Jeffries, I think, was the, the gem of this deal. He was highly touted but hadn't quite lived up to the hype. And he would go on to have some good seasons, not for Kansas City. Miller was a utility infielder, and McReynolds was 32 and coming off a rough season. Saberhagen had some injuries, but he was only 28 and two years removed from a Cy Young. He didn't really turn out for the Mets. He had some injuries over the next few seasons, had a decent year in 94, but that was the strike year. McReynolds played in 92 and 93 for the Royals, but he wasn't really anything special. He dealt with injuries, played only 109 and 110 games those two seasons, hitting 13 and 11 home runs respectively, so not really offering the power that he once had, or the average. He hit 247 and then 245. So consistent, as was his MO, not up to the consistently high levels that he had with the Padres or Mets. After the 1993 season, he is sent back to the Mets in exchange for Vince Coleman, and this final return just didn't go great at all. He had recurring back problems and only played in 51 games in 1994. He is granted free agency after the season and decides to retire, saying, I've been playing since I was five years old, and I never sat on the bench. I don't want to start at age 35. So closing the book on Kevin McReynolds, 12 seasons in the majors, a 265 average with 211 home runs, 807 RBIs, and a OPS plus of 115 never did make it to an all-star game, but finished third in the MVP voting in 1988. 
How about in retirement? Kevin is still married to his high school sweetheart, Jackie. They have two daughters and they live in Arkansas. He said he plays a lot of golf. And until a couple years back, he was still running that duck hunting operation, the Double Deuce, built with his Mets bonus money. He and some friends also at one point owned some pizza restaurants, he said, in Memphis. But in a 2020 article, he said he sold the Double Deuce and is now retired and he can set his own hours. So he's just hanging out, doing some hunting and fishing on his own time, not as a job. So now looking back, David, this is a guy that you remembered his not very cool record breakers card. The front of his card in this set was kind of run of the mill. But now what do we think about Kevin McReynolds after looking at his career? While Mets fans may have been exasperated with how he looked when he played and and that he maybe never hit that peak that Daryl Strawberry hit, Kevin was a much better player than I remember. That 1989 record breaker card was really a throwaway and didn't seem like a cool record, but he was really good at all levels of baseball. He was inducted in the National High School Hall of Fame in 2011. He was nominated in 2014 as a College World Series legend. He was very consistent in the majors, just never had that one huge season. During his peak from 1984 to 1990, he was valued at 26.4 wins above replacement. That's the 12th best among outfielders during that period, tied with Eric Davis, 0.1 behind Dale Murphy. He was 10th among outfielders in home runs during that span, particularly impressive considering he didn't hit more than 29 in a season. Over that run, he averaged 23 home runs, 87 RBIs, and a 272 average. Pretty good for an 80s outfielder. On defense, his first two seasons when he's playing center field in San Diego, he was the second best outfielder in defensive war after Kirby Puckett. However, he was criticized for his defense. Fans thought that he was lazy or unmotivated, but it may have just been that he made the game look effortless, like he wasn't trying. He was actually getting to a lot of the balls that that he could and that maybe other outfielders couldn't get to. But even after moving to left field, he was a good outfielder, leading the National League in outfield assists in 1988 and 1990. He just ended up as a quiet performer on a team that had Lenny Dykstra, Doc Gooden, Daryl Strawberry, The Kid, all of these big personalities, and Kevin just showed up, did his job, and didn't really give the New York media much to go with. After he retired, he stepped away from the game and did what he always seems to have preferred to do, hang out at home, go hunting and fishing. A really good player who was a little bit under the radar who seemed to like it that way. Yeah, not the biggest personality or the biggest mustache, but a solid player and a great story. So thank you, David, for that. Thank you to Thomas J. Brown Jr., who wrote the Sabre bio. And thank you to you at home. If you've ever wanted to cut loose like a double deuce, we'd love to hear from you on Twitter. We're at Tops1988. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next week.